Well, Happy New Year 2018. Let me be the first to welcome you on a balmy Friday morning. A balmy, oh, minus five degrees or so. And by the way, um, some of you may not know we have a tradition here. There are usually, um, usually two guys that try to make it through the entire team season wearing shorts. <laughs> Only one of them made it say, George, stand up where you are. Where's George? Oh, George, yeah. There he is, there he is. Okay, yeah, that's George. John Harper's the other guy, and John's got jeans on today. So George is the only uh, team guy in short, so welcome to the team. We meet, uh, just so you know, schedule-wise, we meet every Friday morning from here right through the end of the team season, which will be on March the 23rd. So no more breaks unless we get uh, just a terrible snowstorm on a, on a Friday morning, but we'll post that on our website if, uh, if that happens. But we'll see you every Friday morning. Uh, two announcements today. One is um, all of you are aware the couples event's coming up. Those of you guys who are married or engaged, happening on January 20th, uh, we're getting close to 500 people registered, so that's going to be sold out. So if you haven't, don't have your registration yet, get that done in the next few days because it's, once it's uh, full, we, we'll, we'll have to shut down registration. So that's going to be a really, really fun night, January 20th. And then I have John Hooking uh, here. John's going to make a short announcement here. John's the director of care ministries here at uh, Chapel Street Church, and uh, he'll point out some, some resources we have in the back page of your team booklet and let you know how to get involved there. John, come on up. Good morning. Brian stole a little bit of my thunder, but I'll try to recoup. Um, Brian likes to use movie clips, if you've noticed, on some of our Friday mornings. I don't have a clip for you this morning, but I have a movie line. I'll give you the line. You tell me who said it in what movie it's in. Here we go. Who are those guys? Butch Cassidy, Sundance Kid. All right. So my next line was going to be, and still is, how many of you are sitting in your chair this morning wondering, who is this guy? So John Hookinga, Director of Care Ministries. And I want to direct your attention to the back of your book this morning. Um, inside the back cover, there are several care groups listed. Turn to that. So these are all care groups that uh, men can be a part of. Some of them are mixed groups, some are for men only. But the uh, Compass Men's Group meets year round. We don't stop, so you can jump into that one anytime. But the urgency for the announcement this morning are the rest of the groups, uh, Divorce Care, Grief Share, Hope for Empty Arms, and Single Parenting, we offer those twice a year. Those groups are starting up again the third week of January. So if this is something that you could benefit from, you're welcome to register and, and sign up. But beyond that, I want to remind you that this is Chapel Street Church. We want you to be the chapel on your street connecting people to the larger church. So if you know somebody who could benefit from one of these groups, we need your help to get the word out. Work colleagues, uh, friends you work out with, golfing buddies, you can't golf right now. If you know somebody who could benefit from one of these groups, we want you to let them know about it. So, appreciate your help. Are we awake yet? Some of you need some more coffee. So here he is, our very own Pastor Brian. <laughs> thank you, John. It's one of the, thank you. Uh, care ministries at our church is one of the things we do. And in fact, all the things we do at our church are open to anyone. You don't have to be a member at our church to participate just like team. So whatever your church background, whether you have one or not, these, these offerings to help people during difficult passageway of life are open. And so open registration and people get involved. So like John said, we, they're for you or for people you know, maybe in your family. Just be aware that you can make that invitation. So thanks for that. All right, here's our story for today. Um, can't remember the last time I did this one. You may remember parts of it, but this is one of my favorites. It's in honor of the couples event. All right. A woman goes to the doctor for her routine exam, but while she's there, she tells the doctor she's worried about her husband. 
Doctor says, well, what's the problem? The woman says, well, it's his temper. I don't know what to do. Every day he seems to lose his temper for no reason, and it scares me. Doctor says, actually, a great many men struggle with that issue. Uh, I think I have just a thing that will help. Whenever you sense your husband starting to get angry, just go get yourself a glass of water and start swishing it around in your mouth. Just swish and swish and swish, and don't swallow until he either leaves the room, calms down, or goes to bed and falls asleep. Well, two weeks later, the woman comes back to the doctor looking fresh and reborn. Doctor says, how are things going? Woman says, well, it's amazing. I did what you told me, and it really works. Every time my husband started to lose it, I swished with water. I swished and swished, and he calmed right down. How does a glass of water do that? Doctor says, the water itself does nothing. It's keeping your mouth shut that does the trick. <laughs> now, that's not one I'm using at the couples event. <laughs> So you, uh, you might want to keep that to yourself. We're in session 14 this week out of 20, uh, 25. And the question, we've been looking at questions all season long. And the question we're going to look at today is if God is with us, why has all this happened? And I'm calling it the question of evil. I'm going to show you a movie clip. I don't think I've shown a clip from this film in all the years of team. It's a, it's a great uh, film based on a true story called Schindler's List. Many of you may know the story of the actual guy, Oscar Schindler, who was a German businessman who um, was running factories in Poland and really w was becoming quite wealthy and then uh, uh, realized that by hiring uh, Jews to work at his factories, he was in fact saving lives from the Nazi regime. He ended up being credited with saving over 1,200 uh, lives through his factories. But this is a scene from um, uh, a, a, a slave labor factory under the rule of the Nazis. And you see, um, it's a hard scene to watch, but it communicates uh, something what we're going to be talking about today. So let's roll the clip and take a look. Oops, wrong one. Yep. What are you making? Hinges, sir. Yeah, I've got some workers coming in tomorrow. Where the hell are they from again? Yugoslavia, Commandant. I've got to make room. Make me a hinge. Yes, sir. Good, but I'm a bit confused, and perhaps you can help me. What I don't understand is that you've been working since I think what about six this morning. Yet such a small pile of hinges. Right, Check the angle lever, maybe it's bent. No, no, no. You wouldn't hear a click, it was the angle lever, it's the pin. Maybe it's the pin. Maybe the pin yeah, shaft is on. greasy. What did I just say? Yeah. Herr Commandant, I beg to report. 
that my heap of hinges was so unsatisfactory because the machines were being recalibrated this morning. I f was put on to shoveling coal. So, if you got the gist of that clip, the uh, the SS officer uh, came in to time how long it took the Jewish worker to make a hinge, and when he timed him, he did it in less than a minute. Then he looked at the pile in the box and said, "If you've been working since this morning, you need to make one of those in a minute. How come you have such a small stack of hinges?" And he took him out to execute him for not making enough hinges. And the man was giving an excuse, saying, well, the machine was being rec recalibrated, I wasn't being lazy, and he tried over and over again because he was nothing to him, nothing, like an animal. Hard scene to watch, it's a hard movie to watch. Um, but it brings up the question of evil. Judges 6, 1 through 14, we're gonna read today, and it c it's the story of Gideon in the Old Testament. And I'm gonna pull out one question that Gideon asked in this process, and we're going to try to answer this question. So let me read this to you. It's a little bit longer section, but we'll break it down. Judges 6, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the, on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock in their tents like a swarms of locusts, and it was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came down and sat under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Were all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Now that's just the first part of the story. You should know that this story way back in Judges is really mostly about God's call to a man named Gideon and what happens after that call. But for our purposes today, I want to zero in on this question that Gideon asked. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? In other words, why is all this evil around us? Why are we suffering so? First part of the answer is, the first part of your outline is, the world is broken. The world is broken. I, uh, my boys were home for uh, Christmas break. We were all here for a few days together. And one of the things we like to do when we're all together is go to see a movie or two. And uh, a couple of them have these movie passes they can go for free. So we went to see a couple of movies. But one of the ones we saw was the one called uh, Darkest Hour. And it's about the beginning of World War II in Great Britain and Winston Churchill. Has anyone seen it? Darkest Hour? Okay. I, I like history and like that sort of stuff, so I kind of like the movie. Uh, my wife told me later she slept through half of it because it was all dialogue and she got a little bit lost. But it's a story of Winston Churchill right as he's becoming prime minister. And the first thing he has to deal with is Nazi Germany because the Germans have been marching through Europe, conquering nation after nation after nation. And now they're right on the doorstep of invading uh, England. And so all the Western world by 1940 or so is having to deal with Hitler. And eventually, World War II engulfs the world in a way that those of us who were born f after the war, I was born in 56, we have almost no way of understanding how, what that war was like. But I did a little research and they now believe, estimate that through the course of World War II, the number of dead, that is military and civilians, reached 72 million people and just during World War II. 
So it produces questions, particularly throughout, West, throughout Western Europe. If there is a God, why? If there is a God, why the Holocaust? If there is a God, how can these things happen? And the first part of that answer is because the world is a broken place. From the horrific mass shooting in Las Vegas to the shooting in Texas to the bombings in Egypt to the atrocities of ISIS to genocide in Syria, it's not hard. It doesn't take a social scientist or a theologian to look around and say the world's a broken place. We see it every day. And the world's been broken for a long, long time. The story we read here in, in the Bible, the story of Gideon, takes place in roughly 1200 B.C. So we're talking about over 3,000 years ago. The story begins, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. It begins with Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Notice, that's where the story starts. We're going to talk more about what that means in just a moment. But evil begins with disregarding God. Okay, evil begins with disregarding God. Now, here's the situation. The Midianites are an aggressive and pagan people group from the region south and east of Israel, what we would call today the Arabian Peninsula. The Midianites have evidently been raiding, coming into the, the outskirts of the region controlled by Israel for about seven years now at harvest time. And maybe it's due to poor leadership. Maybe the leaders of Israel did not have themselves organized enough to defend their territories. Maybe there was a famine in Midian. Who knows how it started? But the Midianites have been invading for seven years, taking anything they can use, crops, livestock, and just destroying all the rest. Verse 5 says, They came with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it, kind of like Nazi Germany in the middle of the 20th century. It's a story about a kind of ancient terrorism, a story that's been repeated over and over again throughout human history. One people group taking whatever they can, whatever they want from another people group just because they have the power to do so. It's a story about evil. It's a story about the evolution of sin, theologically speaking, the evolution of sin in the world. The world is broken. Secondly, even though the world is broken, God is still God. God is still God. One of the most common questions or objections to the existence of God goes like this. How can there be a God when there's so much evil in the world? How can there be a God when there's so much evil in the world? You may have heard questions like that. You may have family members who ask questions like that. You may yourself be asking questions like that. We see the Las Vegas shooting, 58 people gunned down at a concert. How can there be a God? See the atrocities of Syria, children being gassed and faced with chemical weapons. How can there be a God? Years ago, when I was a youth pastor in Glen Ellen, I, I uh, did this a couple times because I'd had a professor do it with us in, in college. But I had uh, high school kids, I just gave them an assignment, uh, draw me a picture of God. That is, take a piece of paper and in five minutes draw a picture of God. The idea is to kind of extract from people, from young people, what their image of God is in their mind. And a lot of the kids drew pictures of, you know, clouds and like a grandfatherly uh, looking guy up in the clouds, maybe sitting on a rocking chair overlooking the world. Some drew pictures of lightning bolts coming from heaven. Some drew pictures of planets. And they were all fairly similar. But one kid... Uh, drew a picture I kept for years. I probably still have it somewhere. He drew a picture of a billiard table, a pool table. And all the pool balls, you looked at them carefully, were, were, had, were planets, like on, on the table. And the God character was standing next to the pool table, had a halo, holding a pool stick, and had kind of a smirk on his face. It was a brilliant picture dri dri drawn by a 17-year-old kid, but it gave me the image of God he had in his head was of a, he's playing games with the universe. Kind of a sarcastic, cynical God just knocking pool balls around, and I knew something about his home life. I knew where his image of God came from. Now, many people look at the brokenness of the world and, and assume that either there is no God or if there is, that God is sadistic and cruel or at least not paying attention. And that's Gideon's question in this ancient story. He says in verse 13, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. He's just playing games. Knocking the pool balls around the table. Where is God? Where is God in all this? It's a common question. 
I don't think it's the best question. We're going to get to the best question in just a moment, but it's a common question. So let me try to give you a classic theological explanation for the existence of evil in the world. And here's where I start. There are lots of ways to do this, but here's how I start. Evil exists because of love. Evil exists because of love. Now, it's counterintuitive. Something in your brain's going, huh? That doesn't make sense. Let's back up. Genesis, the first book in the Bible, we covered parts of it earlier in team, uh, the team season this year. Genesis tells us that God created all things, and he created all things good. At the end of each day of creation, it says God saw that it was good, and when he creates human beings in his own image, he says it is very good. And then... Having created all things good, God places a limit right in the middle of the garden. He says, you can eat from anything in the garden. You can eat from any tree in the garden. You can have anything you want. It's all yours except do not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for if you eat of that tree, you will die. So right in the middle of the garden, God places a limit. God gave Adam and Eve that limit because he loved them. Like a parent establishing limits for their children. You can play anywhere in the yard. You just can't go into the street and play. You can play in the house, but you may not play with matches. Every loving parent gives limits to their children. God in his love gave human beings a limit, but he also gave them a choice. And that's the gift of free will, the gift of freedom. Because without freedom, there is no love or relationship. Think of it this way, back to parenting. I have four sons. When they were little, I could have protected them from all the evil in the world by just chaining them in their rooms 24-7. If I chained them in their room at home, I could protect them from all the perverts and all the predators out there. I could protect them from speeding cars. I could protect them from making their own bad choices, from drugs and all that stuff, by just chaining them in their rooms. But that wouldn't exactly be love, would it? Chaining, chaining them into their rooms would have been a form of evil in and of itself. Would not have been loving. So I had to give them a choice. They can either follow the guidelines I give them and trust me and my love for them, or they can rebel and do whatever they want. That's what God has done with human beings. He's given a limit, but he's also given freedom. Then Satan enters a picture in the book of Genesis and questions God. Did God really say? And then he lies. You won't die. You'll be like God. And all human history, all humankind falls into sin. That's the story of Genesis. So, here it is. God allows sin because he loves. In his love, he grants free will, and human beings have used that freedom to sin against God and against each other. That is the origin of evil. And the evolution of sin is evil in the world today. All sin is the rejection of the limit and love of God. All sin is the rejection of the limit and love of God. So, evil exists because God is loving. You see that? Tucked away in this story is God's own explanation of sin and evil. Verse 10, he says, God, God, he says, I say to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. There it is. You have not listened to me. The fact that the world is broken does not mean that God does not exist. It means that human beings have disregarded the God who created them. And the real question is, why have human beings disregarded God? Not why does evil exist. The question is why have human beings disregarded God? Which leads us to the third point today, and that is God works through people. Verse 11. The angel of the Lord came down and sat under the tree in Ophrah. That's way too close to Oprah for me, but Ophrah. And that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. Notice this. He's threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, the wine press was a hollowed out place in the ground. It's not the normal way to thresh wheat. Usually farmers thresh wheat up in the open air where the wheat could be separated from the chaff. But he's hiding because he's terrified of the Midianites. And then it says, verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, this is God's call to Gideon. And notice, I think God has a sense of humor. So Gideon is hiding. He's a farmer. He's hiding in, the, in a hole in the ground, threshing his wheat because he's terrified the Midians are going to come and take it from him and maybe kill him too. Hail, mighty warrior, the angel says. Gideon is anything but a mighty warrior. Later in the story, in fact, the next few verses, if I'd printed them out, Gideon objects to God's call by saying, my family's the least in our whole tribe, and I'm the least in my family. In other words, God, you can't call me. I'm a complete loser. 
but God sees more in Gideon than he sees in himself. Sound familiar? It's a lot like the story of Moses we looked at a few weeks ago. Verse 13, pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? People still ask, where is God in all this evil? How can there be a God? The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? So here's the summary. Evil exists because God grants freedom. The world is broken because human beings use their freedom to ignore God. The grace of God is that he continues to invite us into relationship with him through Christ, even though we've disregarded him, even though we have sinned, even though we're fearful and hiding in a wine press, God still invites us into relationship with him. God calls Gideon. Gideon rejects, you've got the wrong guy. I can't do what you asked me to do. I'm the least in my family. I'm a total loser. God ignores Gideon's objections completely. He just ignores Gideon's low view of himself and says, go in the strength that you have. Am I not sending you? So here's the theme we see throughout Scripture, throughout the Bible. God chooses to work through men who are willing to listen to his call. God rarely does our work for us. Sometimes he does the miraculous, but mostly he chooses to work through people who have listened to his call, who have received his grace and are willing to serve him with the strength that they have. Here's the questions I want you to deal with around the table today. First, I'm going to explain them a bit. The Midianites invaded and ravaged the land of the ancient Israelites to impoverish them. What might be the equivalent of Midianites in your world today? Now, I'm not talking about the world. I'm not talking about terrorism, and I'm not talking about stuff out there. I'm talking about your world, okay? What are the forces of evil encroaching on the fringes of your life today and threatening? Fear, stress, anger, injustice, sin. What are, what, what's, what's encroaching What are the enemies encroaching in your life today that cause you to hide in a wine press and be fearful? Secondly, in what way might God be calling you to be a mighty warrior? Is there something in your world, personally, work-wise, family, that he wants you to confront? That he wants you to confront? Where is he calling you to be a mighty warrior? So get some coffee. Dig into these questions. I'll wrap you up in time to have our prayer time around the tables.